Uh, hello everyone, it's Abdullah here again and uh, today I'm just going to go through um, the head and neck anatomy again. I know I've explained this before but this is not an, another explanation but it's basically I want to test myself on the knowledge of the head and neck anatomy to make sure that I'm ready for the exam. So I'm going to start by, um, as always, the osteology. Um, and like I said, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to ask myself a question and then I try to answer it, and I would advise that you do the same as well. So let's go on. So we have um, first question: When do cranial sutures ossify? Um, this is from sixteen, uh, from eighteen to twenty-four month. Right? Yes. Name condition: which cranial sutures fuse at birth? It's called craniosynostosis. Age of development of mastoid bone. Um, that's usually two years in both males and females. Diploic veins, these are veins that are present in between the inner and outer table of the, um, the skull, which is a cancerless bone, and it drains into the sagittal sinuses. What is the terion? It's a combination of four bones or the mating of four bones together. That's the frontal bone and timber bone and parietal bone and also the sphenoid bone, specifically the greater wing of the sphenoid. Frontal, parietal, temporal, and the sphenoid. It's a clinically very important, specifically for a few things. And that is the, um, it's, a, it's an important approach, which is called the Tyrion approach to access the circular furs. It's also important because the middle meningeal artery passes in the inner table of this area, which is, if it's injured, might lead to an extradural hematoma. Layers of bare hole, this is a scalp plus temporal bone. And that will be the skin, the connective tissue, the aponeurosis, and also the uh, temporalis muscle with um, its sheath from the outside and inside as well. And then you have the pericranium at the end. So we have these structures, skin, connective tissue, and aponeurosis, loose connective tissue, temporalis, and pericranium. We can argue that loose connective tissue will not be there because the temporalis muscle will be replacing it, but I just added that. What is the source of a subdural hematoma? Uh, the the uh, bridging veins and cerebral veins. Styloid process and muscles attached to it. The muscles attached to the styloid process, styloglossus, stylopharyngeus, and the stylohyoid muscle as well. Yeah, sphenoid sinuses, we have an x-ray in here, that's a frontal sinus, that's a, sphen that's a sphenoid sinus, and this is also the um, ethmoid sinus, and this is a maxillary sinus number three. So I think I got all of them correctly. Great. The base of a skull from the outer surface, we need to identify a few things and also structures passing through them. So that's where we're looking from below the skull. So let's start by number 11. So 11 is foramen oval, and this contains otic ganglion. So it goes with the word oval as well. That's otic ganglion V3 or 5-3, and this is the uh, um, mandibular branch of trigeminal nerve, accessory meningeal nerve, lesser petrosal nerve, and emissary veins as well. Number 12 on the other side, that's foramen spinosum, containing middle meningeal artery. Number three down there, this is the um, carotid canal containing carotid artery, internal carotid artery. Number nine on the other side, this is foramen lastrum and confirmed of two parts. The lower part is cartilaginous or completely closed and the upper part contains the internal carotid artery just passing uh, over it. What about number 20? Number 20 will be the jugular foramen, contain the jugular vein coming out of it, the inferior petrosal sinus, and also the um, um, sigmoid sinus coming to it as well. You have the 9, 10, 11, that's the glossopharyngeal, the vagus nerve, and accessory meningeal nerve. Number 15, this is the hypoglossal canal containing hypoglossal nerve. Number 10 is foramen magnum, which is the biggest one, and this contains the medulla oblongata, spinal cord, spinal arteries, vertebral arteries coming through them, and the apical ligament of the odontoid peg as well. All right. 
47, for example, in here, this is the stylomastoid uh, foramen, and that contains the stylomastoid artery and also the fascia nerve coming out of the skull. All right. I think that's it for this diagram. I'm going to go through my answers. Carotid canal, I mentioned the internal carotid artery, which is the most important. Foramen lastrum, I mentioned cartilaginous and ICA. Great. And then you have foramen magnum. I mentioned the five or six structures, the spinal cord, medulla oblongata, and apical ligament, spinal arteries, vertebral arteries as well. And I also mentioned the hypoglossal canal with hypoglossal nerve, the jugular foramen with all these structures, and the stylomastoid foramen with the fascia nerve and the stylomastoid artery. Continue, and I'm going to go through the internal surface of the skull, and I'm going to cover some of the foramens as well, and going through the answer for uh, foramen valve and also foramen spinosum. So starting by, I mean, it, we're basically still in the above diagram, and here we're looking from the internal surface. This is the anterior cranial fossa, and this is the middle cranial fossa, and finally here that would be your um, posterior cranial fossa. We're going to talk about the boundaries in a minute as well. I think it's one of the questions. So um, the foramens I want to look for here, this is foramen magnum, which uh, we mentioned its content. That's a hypoglossal canal. And this is the jugular foramen number 30. And number 28 is the internal acoustic meatus. Number 10, that is the um, foramen lastrum. And number 12, this is foramen oval, and we'll mention the content. We're going to check in a second. 14 is pinosum. 13 foramen rotundum, and that contains the um, maxillary artery, maxillary nerve. And you have here number um, four, 34. This is the optic canal containing the optic uh, nerve. 38 is the cella tersica. 8 is the dorsum cella. 4 is the clivus. We mentioned that. And 42 is the superior orbital fissure. It's quite important to know the structures in the superior orbital fissure. And this will be the um, one, the nasociliary, the lacrimal, the, um, and the frontal nerve, three nerves together. And also the acute motor nerve, trochlear nerve, and abducens nerve, superior orbital vein. And uh, yeah, that's it. That would be the content of the superior orbital fissure. So let's go through the answer and the content. We talked about the clinoid process and we talked about foramen magnum here, starting by the content. We explained this before. Foramen oval, and we talked about its content as well. Uh, the one that I always remember, uh, forget, is accessory meningeal artery and lesser petrosal nerve. I always say accessory meningeal nerve, which I think I did, but it's accessory meningeal artery and lesser petrosal nerve. Rotundum, we said it contains the uh, maxillary nerve and the spinosum contains the metameningeal artery. Hypoglossal canal contains the hypoglossal nerve, jugular foramen. We'll see the five structures. Uh, you have the sigmoid sinus, inferior petrosal sinus, and also the jugular vein. And then you have 9, 10, and 11 as well. And uh, so that's the jugular foramen. And then we have the superior orbital fissure, and we talked about the lacrimal nasoceriate defrontal, always remember them together, and then acute motor trochlear abdocent, you can remember them together, and finally the superior ophthalmic vein. We have also anterior cranial fossa, uh, the boundaries of the anterior cranial fossa, and, and like I said, I'm trying to answer the questions and test my knowledge, and you can do the same until we reveal the answer, right? So the anterior cranial fossa boundaries, you have and in the front, you have the frontal bone, and posterior, you have the lesser wing of the sphenoid, and also the, 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 the limpus or the anterior cranial process. And it contains the um, frontal lobe uh, in there. All right, so these are the boundaries. Frontal bone, lesser wing of sphenoid, anterior cranial process, and the frontal bone, it's my bone, and the body, the lesser wing of sphenoid. You have the middle cranial fossa. The middle cranial fossa boundaries, anterolateral, anteromedial, posterolateral, and posteromedial. So anterolateral, lesser wing of sphenoid, anteromedial, the lymphus and the clivus, posterolateral, the superior part of petrous part of temporal bone, and the posteromedial, that will be the dorsum cella. 
All right. The floor is formed of the greater wing of the sphenoid and also the squamous and, and petrous part of temporal bone. So that's a middle cranial fossa. Anterolateral, we said, yes, lesser wing sphenoid. Anteromedial lymphous and anterior process. Posterolateral, that's upper quarter petrous part of temporal bone. Posteromedial dorsum cella and the floor contain the body of the greater wing of sphenoid and the temporal bone that contain the twitter gland temporal lobe as well. And as you can see here, anterolateral, anteromedial, posterolateral, posteromedial, and then the uh, bones forming it. Posterior cranial fossa, yeah, so anterolateral, that will be the posterolateral boundary of the middle cranial fossa. So anterolateral, superior border of petrous part of temporal bone, and then you also have the, you also have these, that's anterolateral, and then anteromedial, that's the lymphus and the clivus as well, and also the uh, posterior, that would be the occipital bone, and then you have the floor, the condylate, the basilar, squamous part of occipital bone, and the petrous part of temporal bone as well will be forming it. Okay, great. And then, so this is the posterior cranial fossa. We talked about anterior medial and anterolateral, and then posterior and the floor, and the content as well, brain stem and cerebellum. The clivus, the nerve related to the clivus is the third cranial nerve. Sorry, the sixth cranial nerve, that's the abducens nerve. And it can be compressed again, stuff, right? And then we have the juvenile structure forming it. It's called synchondrosis. And synchondrosis is basically a cartilaginous union between bone composed entirely of hyaline cartilage. So tie with the growth plate here would be hyaline. And finally, the time of fusion will be for the clivus, I think, yeah. So this is the one that I should remember, 12, 13, 14, 15, and then 17, 18, okay? So 12, 13, it starts to, 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 to fuse in a female patient and, or a normal female person. 13, 14 in a male, and finally, 17, 18, it completes its growth on both of them. Yes, so that's the right answer in here. What are the benign tumors of the posterior cranial fossa? That will be uh, acoustic neuroma and ependymoma. Base of a skull fracture. So in this image, we have a posterior, transverse, transesphenoidal base of a skull fracture, and that's the right diagnosis. What are the lytic lesions that can happen in the skull? So the lytic lesions will be any bone metastasis that could be coming from the breast, the lung, the thyroid, the kidney, but not the prostate. The prostate is a sclerotic lesion, okay? Also, we can have uh, Paget's disease, osteomyelitis, and hemangioma, sarcoidosis, and multimyeloma, all right? So these are all the causes for a lytic lesion. So bone metastasis, multimyeloma, osteomyelitis, Paget's disease, sarcoidosis, and hemangioma. I'm very glad I got all the correct answers, okay? Well, temporomandibular joint, we have the type of temporomandibular joint. It's a biarthroidal hinge joint, and that is correct. The articular surface, it has, if my finger here is the head of the mandible and the mandibular fossa, and in between articular disc and articular tubercle. Very glad I got that. So if you can see here, I think on this one, basically in this area, that's the head of the mandible, and that is the mandibular fossa. The blue one is the mandibular or articular disc, and this is the articular tubercle. Very glad. The movement is basically closure, opening, side to side movement, and also protrusion and retrusion as well, going backward. Okay, so that will be the movements. Muscles of the temporal region of the temporal region, all right. So muscles open in the mouth, that would be the DGLM, the digastric muscle, the uh, genuglossus, lateral trigoid and medial trigoid as well. All of these can open the uh, mouth. Okay, great. Muscles of mastication, uh, that would be lateral and medial trigoid, 
masseter muscle and temporalis muscle as well. Excellent. Um, yeah, muscle, uh, blood supply, the temporalis muscle and the skin overlying it. So the superficial temporal nerve supply the skin overlying this muscle and the muscle itself is supplied by the external cordial artery. All right, the deep temporal arteries from uh, the maxillary, which is from the external cordial artery. I should have mentioned that in detail, but it's mainly coming from the external cordial artery to give the maxillary and give the deep temporal flange that supplies it. All right. What are the muscles of mastication? We just mentioned that. So this is the medial and lateral pterygoid, and also the um, temporalis and masseter muscle. All right. Yeah. The neck muscles, we're going to go into this as well. What are the neck muscles? Let's just put down. Yeah, the neck muscles. So we're going to talk about the suprahoid muscle, origin, insertion, nerve supply, and action. Okay, so I'm going to answer this and then um, I take the answer later on, like we always explain. So the suprahoid muscle, we have the hyoid and to the mandible. So that includes the mylohoid muscle. It originates from the mylohoid line in the mandible and insert all the way down into the hyoid bone. Okay. And the nerve supply, the mylohoid nerve from ansa cervicalis, and the action, it can raise the hyoid bone or depress the mandible. So it can open the mouth as well. Remember, we mentioned the DG earlier. In terms of the genioglossus muscle, or the, sorry, the genioglossus muscle arises from the mandible inner surface and insert into the hyoid bone and supplied again by the mylohyoid nerve. And the action is pretty similar, can elevate the hyoid bone or depress the mandible. We have two other muscles coming from there. So we have the stylohyoid muscle. From the name, it's coming from the stylo, the styloid process and insert into the hyoid bone. Nerve supply is the stylohyoid nerve, which is from the facial nerve and can elevate the hyoid bone as well. We also have the um, so we say the stylohyoid, um, there is digastric muscle and the digastric muscle, it has two bellies and they have a common tendon in between uh, that insert into the hyoid bone. So we have one belly coming anterior belly that comes from the mandible and insert into the hyoid bone and the posterior belly comes from the mastoid notch and also insert into the hyoid bone. The nerve supply for the anterior belly is the mylohyoid nerve. Nerve supply of the posterior belly is the, is the digastric branch of the facial nerve. Okay. And the action can elevate the hyoid bone as well. So this is quite quick. I'm pretty sure I missed a few things, but let's check. So the mylohyoid nerve, the mylohyoid muscle, comes from the mandible, mylohyoid line, that was correct, and then insert into the hyoid bone, that is correct. A nerve to mylohyoid, which is from inferior other nerve, it's not, it's not from anterior cervicalis, but from inferior other nerve, and it can elevate the hyoid bone, the floor of the mouth, and so on. Okay. Geniohyoid, it comes from the mandible and insert into the hyoid bone and take from the hypoglossal nerve, C1, um, and also pulls the hyoid and tongue up. Okay, fine. Stylohyoid muscle, stylo process, go to the hyoid bone and also, um, yeah, go to the hyoid bone. Mm, great. And then elevate and retract the hyoid bone and elongate the floor of the mouth. Great. The digastric muscle, we have anterior belly from the mandible and posterior belly from mastoid notch. Uh, they insert in the hyoid bone into a common tendon. Nerve supply, nerve to malohyoid or malohyoid nerve. And digastric branch of the facial nerve, that was correct. And the work of the infrared to depress the mandible or elevate the hyoid bone. Great. So these are the muscles. So look at the question mark in here. This is the malohyoid muscle. It comes from the malohyoid line and it will go to the hyoid bone takes from mylohyoid nerve. This is the anterior belly of the digastric muscle. It takes from a fossa in here, and this is the common tendon, and it's coming from the styloid process. And this muscle, I think that is the stylohyoid muscle, as you can see, stylohyoid muscle, yeah. And this is the posterior belly of the digastric muscle. We know the nerves of life for the bellies, uh, the posterior belly is the digastric branch of facial nerve, and also the other one, the the uh, uh, stylohyoid muscle takes from the stylohyoid nerve, and this is from the facial nerve. Well, triangles of the neck, I think that's a common, a common one. So the triangles of the neck are divided into anterior and posterior triangle. 
uh, and this is mainly by the sternocleidomastoid muscles that divide them into anterior and posterior as well. Okay, I'm going to be asked for further. What are the boundaries of the anterior triangle? It starts from the midline, the mandible, and also the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. They are divided into further four subtriangles: the submental triangle and submandibular triangle. And this is by the digastric muscle anterior and posterior body as well. All right. And then we have the superior body of omohyoid muscle going all the way down that divides it into muscular triangle and carotid triangle as well. So I mentioned the subdivisions are four. These are the submental, the submandibular, and the um, muscular triangle, and also the carotid triangle as well. Okay. Let's go dig in and see. The answer, but I'm pretty sure will be asked as well about the boundaries of the subdivisions, which I'm going to mention one by one as well. So yes, we answered this correctly. These are the boundaries of the anterior triangle, midline, mandible, and anterior bit of the cerebral mastoid, posterior triangle, posterior border of the cerebral mastoid, trapezius muscle, and the middle third of the clavicle. I'm going to come to this, we'll be asked about it. Okay, so the borders, we mentioned it correctly. So all of these, all right. And then the subtriangles, I mentioned the four subtriangles and divided by the gastric and superior belly of umohyoid muscle. Let's dig in. Okay. Let's talk about submandibular triangle boundaries. It has the anterior and posterior belly of the digastric muscle and the inferior border of the mandible, and it contains the submandibular salivary gland, the submandibular lymph node, part of the hypoglossal nerve, and facial nerve as well. And uh, uh, mm, yeah, I think that would be it for the contents. So we talked about the boundaries, anterior and posterior belly, and the inferior border of the mandible. And you have the submandibular gland, lymph node, facial vessels, hypoglossal nerve. Great. And obviously that is the triangle as you can see in here. Great. Uh, the the submental triangle boundaries, it had the midline and the mandible, and also the anterior belly of the digastric muscle. And it contains a submental lymph nodes. The carotid triangle, the boundaries of the carotid triangle, so it has, all right, it has uh, the superior belly of omohyoid and um, also the sternocleidomastoid and the posterior belly of the gastric muscle as boundaries and it contains the carotid sheath. So the answer is not here. Okay, the muscular triangle. So anteriorly, it contains the um, midline, I mean, boundaries anteriorly the midline, and superiorly the hyoid bone, and posterior superior, that will be the superior belly of omohyoid, and posterior inferior, that's the sternocleidomastoid muscle, and that contains some muscles in this area, which is the strap muscle or the infrahyoid muscles. So we talked about the boundaries. Actually, this is the posterior triangle. So the muscular triangle is there, boundaries, Hyoid bone, midline, superior belly of omohyoid, and inferior uh, sternocleidomastoid, and it contains strap muscles, like I mentioned. Great, I'm very happy with this. Posterior triangle, we have the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid, and the anterior border of the trapezius muscle, and the middle third of the clavicle. The floor is formed of the scalenous anterior, middle, and posterior, and it also has a splenius capitis and levator scapula as well. It contains lots of structures. This includes lymph nodes, such as the deep cervical lymph nodes, and the supraclavicular lymph nodes, which is the vercau on the left side. It also has some vessels. This is the subclavian artery and the external jugular vein. It has some nerves. This is the accessory nerve. Most importantly, the brachial plexus on the lower end, and also the phrenic nerve, and the great erector nerve. So these are the content. Um, it might, so I mentioned the lymph nodes and the vessels and uh, also the floor, including the muscles. I think these are most of the content. There might be one more thing, but we'll find the answer now. It's subdivided into two triangles, which is the subclavian tri triangle or the, and the occipital triangle as well. And this is by the inferior belly of omohyoid. So the inferior belly, the, the omohyoid muscle will come from two bellies, one that divides the anterior triangle 
and the one that divide the posterior triangle. Let's see the answer. So these are the boundaries, as we explained, and this is the posterior, the um, inferior belly of omohyoid muscle, and obviously this is the superior. And that's from Teach Me Anatomy. Okay, we talked about the boundaries. I think we got it correct. And we talked about the floor. Got it correct as well. And divided by two. Again, correct. Nerves, we've said all of them. Vessels, we've said all of them. Muscles at the floor, we said all of them. And again, lymph nodes, supraclavicular lymph nodes, and the occipital lymph nodes, which I haven't mentioned. Let's talk about lymphatic drainage. Just asking a quick question. The regions that are drained by the preurecular lymph node, which will be right there. So you'll have the external ear, the external acoustic meatus, the area over the mandible, and the gum as well, and also that area over the, the uh, uh, parotid gland as well. Okay, these are the regions. Upper half of the face, temporal region I didn't mention, the auricle and the gums as well. Good. So I didn't mention the upper half of the face and the temporal region. But I mean, pretty much you mentioned that, which is this area, basically. Microscopic finding, interpret. So um, looking at this one, it looks like metastasis. I mean, obviously this um, uh, um, image is coming from, um, I think, basically a sample from the protic gland. It could be melanoma metastasis. I'm not really convinced, to be honest, uh, but it's one of the questions that have been repeated multiple times, I believe. Well, thyroid gland, I'm going to talk a little bit about thyroid. All right, to get it ready. The blood supply of the thyroid gland, the way I'm going to answer. So, so as I mentioned, guys, the main thing of these videos is just to revise just before the exam. So we're just answering questions and not really explaining things. Okay. The blood supply of the thyroid gland, we have arterial blood supply. This is the superior thyroid artery and the inferior thyroid artery. The superior thyroid comes from the external carotid artery. And the inferior thyroid is from the thyrocervical trunk, which comes from the first part of subclavian artery. The venous drainage goes through three veins. That drains into two of them, two veins. Okay. The three veins, superior, middle, and inferior. The superior and middle drains into the um, ternal jugular vein, and the inferior thyroid vein drains into the brachiocephalic vein. Let's see the answer. Arterial supply, superior, middle, superior, and inferior. And I did not mention the thyroid emma artery, which comes from the brachiocephalic artery or the aortic arch. Venous drainage, we talked about the three, superior and middle, internal jugular vein, inferior brachiocephalic vein. Great. The lymphatic drainage of the thyroid gland, so it's right there. It goes the pretracheal, prelaryngeal, paratracheal, superficial and deep cervical lymph nodes, as far as I remember. Prelaryngeal, pretracheal, paratracheal, cervical lymph nodes, and brachiocephalic lymph nodes, you can mention them as well. The embryology of the thyroid gland, it comes from, arises from the foramen cecum, which at the posterior end of the tongue, and then it descends all the way down to around C4 to C6. The abnormalities of the embryology can happen due to descent, failure of descent, or failure of obliteration of the duct. If it was a failure of descent, that could be a pyramidal thyroid gland, Prelaryngeal thyroid gland and the pretracheal thyroid gland and lingual thyroid gland. It can also uh, be a problem due to failure of obliteration of the duct leading to a thyroglossal duct cyst. Foramen cecum, we mentioned that. Loop around the higher bone. Abnormalities, we mentioned incomplete descent. Lingual, pyramidal, prelaryngeal, and pretracheal. Very pleased. An incomplete closure of the pathway that would be thyroglossal duct cyst. All right. The vertebral level of the thyroid gland, it's C4 to C6. Excellent. Why does the thyroid gland move with deglutition? So the thyroid gland is contained within the pretracheal fascia. Okay. And this fascia is attached to the hyoid bone up and also down to the thoracic inlet. So when we, we, we uh, during deglutition, the suprahyoid muscle will pull the hyoid bone up and this will pull the pretracheal fascia up and the thyroid gland will move with deglutition. This is why during the examination, it's quite important to assess the patient to swallowing uh, um, to determine if this swelling is from the thyroid gland or from somewhere else. 
Thyroid gland is contained pretracheal fascia, which is attached to the thyroid cartilage and the higher bone. During the glutation, the higher bone pulled up, the superoid muscle will pull them up, and subsequently, the tracheal fascia. The thyroidectomy, that will be the external laryngeal nerve, recurrent laryngeal nerve, and cervical sympathetic chain. Very quickly. External laryngeal, recurrent laryngeal, and cervical sympathetic chain. The cell of origin in medullary thyroid cancer, this is the paraphericular C-cell. Where does papillary thyroid gland spread? To lymph nodes, mainly the deep cervical lymph nodes on superficial tissue. Late complication of thyroidectomy, hypocalcemia, hypothyroidism, and hypoparathyroidism. I should mention it the other way around, to be honest. Parathyroid gland, very quickly. We have four parathyroid gland located in the posterior surface of the, the thyroid gland. We have two superior, two inferior. The location, we mentioned that. Hormone secreted, parathyroid hormone, embryology, the two superior come from the fourth parenchymal arch, and the two inferior come from the third parenchymal arch or parenchymal arch. Blood supply it mainly takes blood supply from the inferior thyroid artery, which is a branch of the thyroid cervical trunk, which is a branch of the first part of the subclavian artery. This is why during thyroidectomy, clipping or of this artery, the inferior thyroid artery, might lead to damage to the parathyroid gland, and this is why we get infarction and then hypoglycemia. The larynx, quite interesting. The nerve supply of the larynx, to answer the question of nerve supply, blood supply, we always need to specify what we're talking about. So the nerve supply of the larynx could be motor and sensory. So the sensory nerve supply is below the vocal cord, that's the recurrent laryngeal nerve, Above the vocal cord, internal laryngeal nerve. And the motor, all the muscles are supplied by the recurrent laryngeal nerve, except the preclothyroid muscle, which is supplied by the external laryngeal nerve. Motor and sensory as well, above the vocal cord, below the vocal cord, recurrent laryngeal nerve. What are the attachments of the vocal cord? Posterior arytenoid cartilage, anterior thyroid cartilage, laterally to the laryngeal muscles, and medially to it's a free border okay yeah i'll mention that i'll show you this image very quickly so as you can see here that's medial as a free border and lateral to the laryngeal muscle and posterior to the retinoid cartilage and anterior to the thyroid cartilage excellent so we'll see this is anterior and that's posterior great and these are the vocal cords in more detail, as you can see, this is called the vestibular folds and the vocal folds, and that's the trachea from the inside. The action of the vocal cords can open by the posterior cricoretinal muscle and can close by the lateral cricoretinal muscle and can become very tense by the cricoretinal muscle. I'll tell you a trick here. So open, P, reminds me with posterior and the the L in close reminds me with lateral and then tensing with precothyroid. As you can see here, that's the action of, try to test yourself, that's the action of the crico, the posterior cricothyroid muscle because it's open, all right? And that's the action of the lateral because it's closed, as you can see. And this is very tense, that's the cricothyroid muscle or the thyroid. Quite a tricky question. Uh, so it could be partial entry or um, complete entry. And both of them could be unilateral or bilateral. So let's talk about the partial injury. Could be unilateral, and that will cause dyspnea or shortness of breath. Or bilateral, and that will lead to a um, respiratory compromise. The complete injury on the other side can be unilateral or bilateral. Unilateral can cause um, hoarseness of the voice, and bilateral can lead to um, aphonia and absence of cough as well. So let's see the answer. Partial, it always reminds me of respiration. It's partial, okay? Piration, so dyspnea and respiratory compromise. And unilateral here is hoarseness of the voice and this is aphonia or absence of the cough. Let's do some anatomy in here, some cadavers. So we're gonna start by, well, we have lots of numbers in here. I would like just to go randomly 
through um, the these numbers. 25 is the parotid gland, 30 is the sternocleidomastoid, 13 is the great erector nerve, and 19 is the erector timber nerve, and you have here 41 is the trapezius muscle. You will notice that I covered the posterior triangle of the neck with some of its content, not all of them, but just some of them. All right. And also, I will talk about this muscle. This is the inferior belly of omohyoid muscle. As you can see here, that's a tendon in the middle, superior belly, and this is the inferior belly of omohyoid muscle, which divides the posterior triangle into the subclavian and the occipital triangle. I think this is how, really, that we should try to use this nice dissections. All right. On the other side, so we'll talk, we'll talk that this is the parotid gland. And as you see here, that will be the masseter muscle. The 26 is the platysma muscle. That's the angle, the, the, that's the mandible, all right? 11 is, um, looks like an artery. It's quite tortuous. This is the facial artery. 12 is the facial vein. 28, a vein coming from the parotid gland. That is the retromandibular vein. 17, standard jugular vein. Two to the ansa cervicalis and one as well. Seven is a common carotid artery. And we talked about 17 very briefly. 31, well before 31, I'm gonna go on the top. So we took 26 is the platysma. Three is, this is the digastric muscle and that's the anterior belly of digastric muscle. 23 is the mylohyoid muscle. 15 is the hyoid bone. And you can see those two muscles going to the hyoid bone. Try to remember the origin, insertion, and nerve supply of these muscles. So anterior belly takes from the mylohyoid nerve. And this is mylohyoid nerve as well. 15, hyoid bone. This is the omohyoid muscle, superior belly, 34. 38, this is the thyrohyoid muscle. And that will make 24 the thyroid cartilage. 32 is sternothyroid muscle. And 31 is the sternothyroid muscle muscle and this we talked about four strap muscles or the infrahyoid muscle right and these are 31 sternohyoid sternothyroid thyrohyoid and omohyoid so now we remember four important muscles yeah I'm, I think I'm very happy with that I covered all this diagram and the answers I'm pretty confident they are correct but feel free to check I'll leave it for a second you can pause check the answers and see if you are concerned about anything and of course let me know if there is any issue parotid gland interesting what is the surface anatomy of the parotid gland so i'm going to explain it to my examiner in this way i'm going to put through four points one in the center in the masseter one two centimeter below alantra to the, the angle of the mandible one in the uh, uh, enter tragic or just in front of the tragus and one on the center of the mastoid process. I'll join all of them together and that will be the surface anatomy of the protic gland. However, about the protic duct, it's usually the middle third between the line drawn between the philtrum of the mouth to the tragus on this side. Okay? I think I said it correctly. You can check, but pretty confident about this. Blood supply of the protic gland. When we're asked about blood supply, we always enter venous and arterial. So arterial blood supply coming from the terminal branches of external carotid artery, which is superficial temporal and maxillary artery. Venous drainage, retromandibular vein, which goes into the jugular vein. Nice. Lymphatic drainage, upper deep cervical lymph nodes, and deep parotid lymph nodes as well. Yes. Structure passing through. The parotid gland, it's fear the lymph nodes. So F is the facial nerve. E is external carotid artery. E is the auricular timber nerve. R is the retromandibular vein. L is the deep lymph nodes of the parotid gland. Excellent. Types of the parotid cerebral secretion, it's mainly serous and water rich by the effect of the parasympathetic. The sympathetic can make it. Uh, uh, a sort of um, dry or low volume and enzyme rich. Parotid lump could be traumatic, inflammatory, such as mumps, or um, infective, such as mumps, inflammatory, 
such as McCollix syndrome or Jugrin syndrome. And neoplastic could be benign and malignant, and it's covered in pathology section. And finally, the um, I think that's pretty much it for the lymph node. The deep, uh, yeah, we talked about the deep part of lymph node enlargement, so I always forget this bit. So any metastasis to these lymph nodes. Yeah, that's an important one, and I left it in bold just to remember it. What is the parasympathetic nerve supply to the protein gland? Okay, so it takes from a uh, uh, glossopharyngeal nerve. So the origin is coming from the inferior cerebral nucleus, passes through the glossopharyngeal nerve, and it will go to the uh, tympanic plexus, and the lesser petrosal nerve, and then auricular temporal nerve to end up in the gland. So let's see if that was correct. I suspect there might, I might have missed one thing. I mentioned the tympanic plexus, but not the tympanic nerve, but it should be right. And I did not mention the otic ganglion. So as you see here, inferior salivary nucleus, and then we'll go through what we just mentioned to the protic gland. So you have inferior salivary nucleus. This is the otic ganglion. If you track it down, that's inferior glossopharyngeal nerve, salivary nucleus, tympanic plexus, tympanic nerve, otic ganglion, auriculotemporal nerve, down to the gland. What is the nerve supply of the parotid gland? Sympathetic parasympathetic through the auricular temporal nerve and also great auricular nerve for the skin overlying it. All right? For the sensory. What is Frey syndrome? So usually, as we talked, the parasympathetic supply will lead to production of serous secretions, which is water-rich. And it's mainly supplied by the auricular temporal nerve. Due to any damage to the auricular temporal nerve, regeneration might happen in relation with the sensory supply to the gland, which is the great auricular nerve. So every time the patient will start to eat or smell some food, they will might have some sensations over the parotid gland, which is a sweaty or becoming uh, quite irritant to the patient. Auricular temporal nerve, so like we explained, it supplies the parasympathetic fibers to the parotid gland. Damage of the auricular temporal nerve can cause uh, a regular regeneration causing switch to the sympathetic response and also to the sensory response as well. Good. Cranial nerves carrying parasympathetic fibers, 1973. That's 10, 9, 7, and 3. Okay. I think, yeah, 1973. But 1972 is the um, vitamin K dependent coagulation factors. This is 10, 9, 7, and 2, of course. Submandibular salivary gland. All right. Where does the duct open in submandibular? Just on both sides of the frenulum, on the base or the floor of the mouth. Yeah. Type of secretion could be serous and mucinous secretion. Again, it has sympathetic and parasympathetic supply. Nerve at risk during submandibular gland dissection could be the hypoglossal nerve and the lingual nerve. I think, and the marginal mandibular nerve of the facial nerve as well. Lingual nerve, hypoglossal nerve, marginal mandibular band of the facial nerve. What is the external carotid artery? Okay, so we're going to talk about this as well. The course, external carotid artery is one of the two terminal branches of the common carotid artery at the level of, C, of C4. And then it will enter through the parotid gland and will terminate into dividing into two terminal branches, superficial timbral and maxillary nuclei. Let's see, upper border of C4, behind the nickel the mandible in the substance of the parotid gland, and it will give many branches. Nerves passing anterior to the external carotid nerve uh, uh, artery, that would be the hypoglossal nerve. The branches, I always like to classify it, anterior branches, posterior branches, medial branches and terminal branches. Terminal, we mentioned the superficial temporal and also the maxillary branch. Anterior, you have the superior thyroid and you have the lingual and the facial artery. And posterior, you have the posterior auricular and occipital branch and the ascending pharyngeal from the medial surface as well. Anterior surface, we mentioned that. Posterior surface, occipital and posterior auricular. Medial surface, ascending pharyngeal 
and then terminal branches we mentioned them as well. The carotid body site and its significance. Carotid body is at the lower end of the internal carotid artery or the upper end of the common carotid artery. It's a chemoreceptor which is sensitive to the pH. Carotid sinus. Um, again, it's present on the upper end of the common carotid artery and it's a mechanoreceptor, all right, which means it responds to the stretch of the artery or wall and can cause some sort of increasing the sympathetic tone to lead to vasoconstriction during case of shock. Yeah, at the bifurcation or at the internal carotid artery. Baroreceptor or mechanoreceptor, maintaining the blood pressure. Facial artery palpation. Where to palpate the facial artery? Usually the facial artery will come just, uh, I mean, right there, just at the lower part of the mandible, and then will enter up to the face from just anteriorly to the uh, masseter muscle. So I would say like this, I'll ask the patient to clench their teeth so I can feel the masseter muscle and just anterior and on the inferior border of it, I will just start feeling the facial artery. And you can try it on yourself. As you see, so this is literally where it should be at the point X, right there. What will happen if the facial artery was ligated? There will be lots of collaterals formed with the facial artery from the other side and also the maxillary artery as well. Contralateral and the maxillary artery. 